What is going on YouTube? I am Lamont at Large. Today I am at the Cicadia Cemetery here in Tarpon Springs, Florida. Timothy Scott Leonard, September 13th, 1966 to June 14th, 1974. Planted on earth to bloom in heaven. This year is James Richard Haynes, May 20th, 1959 to February 27th, 1985. So James, uh, he was a race car driver, well, sprint car to be exact. Uh, sprint cars are those little, they look like go-karts and they'll have wings on the top of them, kind of like in his uh, picture, but they're quite a bit bigger than go-karts and they go a lot faster. And he started his career racing motorcycles before he switched to sprint cars. And he was an up and coming uh, young race car driver in the sprint car racing scene and he was competing in a sprint car race in phoenix arizona on february 24th 1985 when he crashed uh, and he got severely injured and he was taken to the hospital where he fought for his life for three days before succumbing to the injuries from that race Here we have Stephen and Nancy Everett. They were married November 24th, 1972, and they died June 5th, 1974. They were only married about a year and a half. Uh, Stephen was 20 years old, and uh, Nancy was the same age. And Patricia, I'm assuming is Stephen's sister, uh, died along with them. Now, I looked for quite a bit of time to see what happened to them. I couldn't find anything online. Um, normally when you have graves like this with people dying together, more times than not, it's a automobile accident. I believe if it was a murder, it would be all over the internet, at least in some form or fashion, but I couldn't find anything. So sometimes you just can't find anything. And if I were to research the way I wanted to without time being an issue I would be here for about an hour but rest in peace to uh, Patricia Stephen and Nancy in loving memory of my beloved wife Mabel this marble statue sculptured by your beloved husband Peter This here is the grave of Constantine Milo, better known as Dean to his friends and family. August 28, 1938 to August 10, 1980. America is the greatest country in the world. Um, immigrants, hundreds and thousands come here every year to experience the American dream, make money, make a great life for your children, your grandchildren, so forth and so on. And Constantine's parents, Katina and Satir, they were immigrants from Albania. They came here to this country to work hard and do right by their name and right by their children. They came here, they had three children, Constantine, Sophie, and Fred. They immigrated first to Ohio and in the basement of their house, they started a makeup business. And it went from the basement of their house to owning a small shop to owning a warehouse. Constantine here took a more hands-on approach with the family business. And because of his hard work and dedication, he turned it into a multi-million dollar cosmetic business. So as their parents are getting older, in 1975, they retired and left the business to Constantine, his brother Fred, and his sister Sophie. Constantine was the president of the business. Sophie and Fred were the vice presidents. And they're working, they're working. Constantine is noticing that, you know, Sophie and Fred... They're not really interested in the business. They're more interested in other things that they're doing. So he moves them to less critical roles within the company. And eventually 
he just decides to go ahead and fire them. He fires his brother and sister. Now, however, they're still keeping their six figure a year salary and they still own one third of the company. They just no longer have an acting role in the day to day operations of the business. Well, apparently Fred and Sophie did not like that, nor did his mother. So Fred starts concocting a plan to basically take his brother out. He goes to a first guy. He's looking for a hitman to take his brother out. Can't seem to find one. He starts asking people, asking people. Uh, it even goes to uh, the owner of a small vending business that had vending machines at their warehouse. The vending machine owner knows of a guy, a Vietnam vet, kind of wacky, you know, been to war. Maybe he'll do it. He's crazy. By the name of Tom Mitchell. Tom Mitchell says, yeah, I think I could take care of it. He knows another guy, but nothing comes forward. He's looking around, looking around. Finally, they find a hitman to do the job by the name of David Harden. 22 years old, a two-bit thug from Kentucky, a bum, drug addict, loser. August 10th, 1980, the plan comes into fruition. David, posing as a Western Union telegram delivery guy, knocks on Constantine's door What a fake telegram, hands him the telegram. When Constantine goes to take it from his hand, he pulls out a gun, orders him inside the house, lie flat on your stomach. Dean doesn't know what's going on. He's hands up. He's like, what, what are we doing here? He says, get on the floor now. He turns around, gets on the floor, shoots him twice in the back of the head, killing him. Detectives come, process the scene. They see a empty telegram with nothing on it. They're searching leads. This guy is very, very, very well known here in this part of Florida, all over Tampa and Tarpon Springs. The case grows cold. However, the detectives are looking at the family. Something's not right here. They're interviewing uh, employees of the company, letting them know, yeah, he did fire his uh, brother and his sister. Uh, there was some heated words between them. Uh, even the mother did not like that her son did that, and the father went along for the ride. So they're looking at Fred and Sophie, but they, they just don't know exactly what's going on. But they're looking especially hard at Fred. Eventually, David Harden, he gets a little bit angry. Why? Because he was promised about $20,000, $22,000 or so for the hit. He only got paid a fraction of it. He's going up to Fred, where's my money, where's my money? He's like, oh yeah, I'll pay you, I'll pay you. Oh, okay, well, mistake number one. Actually, mistake number two, mistake number one was killing your own brother. So, when in Arizona, David has no money, he's a petty crook, he gets arrested for theft in Arizona, and he already knows like the heat is on back in Florida, so he decides to spill the beans on everything. He's going to tell the detectives everything they want to know. They extradite him from Arizona to Florida. He sits down. He talks to the detectives. He said, listen, uh, Fred Milo hired me to kill Constantine right here. He said he would give me $22,000. He paid me like less than two grand of it. He owed me another $20,000. I posed as a Western Union telegram person and I shot him in the back of the head. Now, you know that these detectives, they got the death penalty out here. They got old Sparky, a.k.a. the electric chair. They're probably threatening this guy. That's why, probably why he spilled the beans, also not being paid. So they tell him, okay, this is what we're going to do. This family has a lot of ties uh, to the underworld section of society. Not saying Constantine here, but the brother, uh, you know, the mother, the sister. I mean, when you got a lot of money in Florida, people want to talk to you, so forth and so on. So... They tell him this, listen, David, if you testify against Fred and the 10 or 11 other people involved in this murder, because he told he told him everything, every single person that was involved that knew about the murder that was going to happen. He said, if you testify, we won't go for the death penalty for you. We'll give you a life sentence in the witness protection program. But. You'll only do about 15 years. You'll be up for parole. They'll grant you parole automatically because they'll know in your paperwork that you helped us 
solve the murder here of Constantine. David takes the deal, goes to court, testifies, points the finger right at Fred and the 10 or 11 other people involved in this crime. Prison sentences are handed out. Eventually, Fred pleads to the murder charge. Uh, he gets 15 years to life in prison. I believe he served about 12 or 13 years and in about 1998, he died in prison of a heart attack. So David, David Harden, the guy who killed this man right here, he goes into prison under an assumed name, does his 15 years, comes up for parole, gets denied. He gets denied and he's like, well, I guess I got to do another 15 years because that's when his next parole date is. So he excuses himself in the witness protection program. They have had to move him from one prison to another. All the inmates are looking at him. The rumors are starting to go around. This guy's a snitch. And that's kind of where the story ends. Uh, this guy, eventually, I'm, I'm imagining him being 22 years old in 1980. Uh, he might still be alive today. I don't know. I, he, he's, not in, he's no longer in prison. Uh, so he kind of got screwed by the government. Um, Constantine here got murdered by his own family. Uh, and almost a dozen people went to prison. You know, this, this, this goes to show you at the end of the day, you can't, you know, when, when it comes to money, especially a business that's worth almost $50 million, you can't trust anybody. You can't even trust your own family, your own blood. This man worked really, really hard to achieve the American dream, and it was taken away from him by his own family members. It says on her grave, her memory is blessed. This is the grave of Deborah Jean Palfrey. If anybody watching this video knows who this woman is off the top of their head without searching on Google, I would be very impressed on your uh, in, insanely ironproof memory. But uh, many of you probably don't know who she is. Uh, she was better known as the DC Madam. Uh, she was being investigated for racketeering and fraud. Basically, let's just call it what it is. I'm going to take a very long story that I believe was made a big deal for pretty much nothing. She ran a call girl service and high price hookers would hook up with the big wigs in and around Washington, D.C. That's all it was. If you want to say that prostitution is a bad thing, you know, we all have our own opinions. There's bad aspects of it at the end of the day. However, that's all there was doing was she ran a prostitution business. OK, that's it. And the news media made such a huge deal about this only because the potential of some of her clients being figures related to the political world that they just wanted to find out who was getting prostitutes. That's all it was. What senators, congressmen, uh, mayors, uh, aldermen, what have you. So eventually she's arrested on racketeering charges after a, about a year or two investigation of her. And they released phone records and all the legacy news media outlets went through all the records and guess what? There was nothing newsworthy of anybody that was a client of her that was on those records. Oh boy, they were hoping, they were hoping that they could get somebody, but nothing. You know, high-priced attorneys, you know, millionaire businessmen, that was about it. Nobody really associated with the political world. And they, they made this, life's, uh, this, this lady's life a living hell for two, three years. Andrew Garcia, December 16th, 1984 to June 1st, 2006. Do believe I will never leave you. I'm always in your heart. 
don't forget my soul is near you we will never be apart uh, andrew was a passenger in his best friends joseph egan's 2001 acura and when they got into a car accident they hit a tree andrew died in the crash when the police and the paramedics came joseph got out of the car appeared fine went to the hospital they did a breathalyzer test and i believe also a blood test and his bac was 0.14 that's twice the legal limit here in the state of florida and he was arrested and charged with dui manslaughter of course you get a lawyer when you're in trouble like that and joseph and andrew were best friends and eventually they go to court and for sentencing joseph's attorney was asking for less than the 10 years four months that the guidelines that judges go by for sentencing criminals less than that and the judge told joseph and his attorney even though joseph was very remorseful i mean he killed his best friend That the judge, in fact, gave him that sentence. So he was already out and free. And he'll have to live for the rest of his life knowing that he put his best friend here in the ground. Christopher George Zutz, December 15th, 1983 to July 4th, 2012. Christopher died in a boating accident. Apparently... He was in his boat heading towards the marina and hit some kind of object. And he fell off the boat into the water and the boat ran over him. A very odd accident and uh, every parent's absolute worst nightmare. You're going to meet your dad at the marina or you're going to go fishing or what have you. And a just a, a horrible accident happens, I mean... Uh, very, very sad. This is Mario Jenkins. He was a member of the University of Central Florida Police Department. And on September 24, 2005, he was working undercover at a UCF football game. They were tasked with looking for underage drinking and checking IDs of people that they seen drinking. And he seen somebody drinking that didn't look like they were 21 and asked them for ID. It looked like a struggle ensued. And somehow in the struggle, Officer Jenkins' firearm got discharged, which alerted another cop who came to the scene and shot Officer Jenkins three times, killing him. Apparently, he didn't know that uh, he was a police officer. And the cop that killed him was cleared of all wrongdoing. And the idiot punk that Officer Jenkins was trying to rein in, he got six months in jail for assaulting a police officer. I believe a lesser charge than that, disorderly conduct or something along those lines.